Welcome to the afternoon session of the Application Economy Theater. This presentation is being delivered by Cognizant, an award-winning and gold sponsor of CA World 2015. Cognizant is a known leader in the digital assurance space and has hundreds of transformation projects. Shamim is the AVP for Cognizant of the digital assurance practice. He has over 15 years of experience and was formerly the chief technology officer for HP Software. In addition to being a fantastic digital assurance leader, Shamim is also a comic book fan and a Trekkie. Please welcome Shamim Ahmed. Thank you, thank you, Nora. Glad to be here. Um, everybody have a great lunch? Everybody have a great lunch experience? How many of you had a great lunch experience? <laughs> Just one. And I was personally looking for a bottle of water and I couldn't find it, right? So my experience was a little bit curtailed. But uh, anyway, so the, this session is about how we assure digital transformation. So you know, we heard a lot of um, good uh, te you know, technology talk this morning um, about what digital transformation is, what are the key imperatives of digital transformation, and why is digital transformation so important, right? So this session will focus on what does it mean to do quality assurance for digital transformations, okay? Just by show of hands, how many of you here are, are in the business of quality assurance? Okay, very good. So this would be very relevant for you. And for the others that are not QA professionals, um, you will get to appreciate your colleagues a little bit better in the QA profession. So uh, let's get started. Um, so we all know, you know what digital assurance is, I mean, what digital is, right? And now what we want to find out is, why is this important, right? So let's look at the, uh, the challenges that our businesses are facing in the context of digital transformations, right? The first and foremost thing is about assuring a high degree of customer experience, right? Um, as Mike pointed out in the morning in the keynote session, that you could have a perfect product, right, that meets the requirements and meets the functionality requirements, performance requirements, security requirements, right? But if the experience isn't great, nobody's going to use it, and therefore you have a failed product, right? Um, so it's very, very important in, in an age of digital and an age of mobility to ensure a very high degree of customer experience. And we're talking about digital customer experience. In other words, the experience that your users have when they interface with your business through digital channels, right? Be it through a mobile app, through a device, um, or through the web portals, et cetera, et cetera, right? So for example, um, how many of you reacted positively to some of the new features that Facebook rolled out, right, in terms of you know, safety check and all those kind of things, right? Maybe a very useful feature, but you know, they make adjustments based on the feedback that they get from the real users, right? And that's the experience we're talking about. So that's the first thing um, that we got to assure, and it's very, very important for the chief marketing officer, for example, right, as they're launching, or the chief strategy officer as they're launching new products, you know, they think about, well, what will, this, what, you know, what will it take to make this product successful from an experience perspective, okay? The second thing is, how do you always secure, or how do I deliver my products and services at the speed that's necessary for, for the digital world, right? And we talked about things like DevOps in the morning, right? Speed is everything. If I can't get my product out to market in time, and my competitor gets, gets it out there before me, then, then I've essentially lost the market, right? First movers have that, have that advantage, right? So there, I think the need from a QA perspective is that we got to be not only doing quality assurance and assuring quality, but we also need to be promoting velocity and agility, right? QA is often looked at as an impediment to the whole life cycle, right? And our whole idea is to show you how QA can, can accelerate and, ag and agilize the life cycle as opposed to uh, being an impediment, okay? Number three, of course, how do I secure? Right? With all of these digital channels and available to our customers, right? which means that the number of interfaces to our systems are ever, ever more. Right? You've got your devices, you've got all those mobile channels and everything. Things get hacked every day. I mean, I, mean, I forget the number of records that Mike mentioned that get compromised on a daily basis. Right? So it's very, very important that as customers adopt and roll out their business and on digital channels, they secure their business. Right? So that's all about information assurance. And last but not the least, how do I maximize the value chain, right? And what this means is, 
digital brings along a whole bunch of different technologies, right? So you've got social, you've got mobile, you've got analytics, you've got cloud, IoT, and who knows what genomics, and who knows what else, right? And the, the spectrum of technologies keep expanding, right, as, as uh, days go by. So real question is, is are, are the use of all these technologies, are they having a positive impact on the business, right? In other words, if you look at the customer's value chain, right, from the point that information is created to the point it's disseminated, used, and so on and so forth, are all these digital technologies helping to grow the business, improve the customer experience, or is it an impediment? For example, you've heard about, for example, the, 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 uh, the video that we saw in the morning, right? So they were going mobile, launching a new portal, and all of a sudden, the backend couldn't keep up, right? So, so there you go. So, so maximizing and assuring the value chain and making sure the technology is not actually impacting the business causing crashes and so on and so forth is an important part of what we call technology assurance. In other words, when we're introducing new technology, social, mobile, analytics, cloud, whatever be it, right, it's not actually stopping the business, it's not crashing the business, okay? So with all of that, we're going to look at how digital assurance is going to be different from quality assurance. And I can tell you it's going to be very, very different in the days going forward, right? Digital assurance has just about started, right? Over the next five or six years, this is going to really um, you know, pick up momentum. So let's look at the different ways in which um, DA will be different than key, traditional QA, right? First and foremost, we're going to be stepping off from doing what we call pure application testing to system testing, right? Because if you think about it in a digital economy, in a digital business, it's all about the entire system, the ecosystem of, let's say, a mobile app that talks to, um, or, or, or an application that resides on your, on your personal device, right? Be a Fitbit or other, you know, tr other tracking device that we'll be carrying along, a GPS, for example, then talks to the app on the smartphone, and then talks to the cloud-based cloud application that talks to backend servers, right? There's a huge technology chain that's, that's, that's involved here, right? In getting an application running. Um, so it's all about making sure that the entire ecosystem of technologies is assured. It's not about specific applications, because you might have silos of applications that are well QA'd, but if the whole system doesn't work together, like we saw in the example in the morning, then it's a failure, right? The second piece is QA is now being challenged to assure more than the standard functionality, performance, and security. They are being now challenged to assure a certain level of customer experience, right? In other words, the chief marketing officer is going to come to tell, tell QA, right, you know, I know you got all that stuff, but what's my customer experience going to be, right? Can you assure a certain level of stickiness on my portal or my mobile app, right? All of those questions are going to get asked, which means that Kiwi has now become the guardian for the brand, right? And the, and the overall experience, right? And we've seen some horror stories around how, you know, guffers from a mobile application perspective have, have tarnished a brand, right? So we'll look at some of those examples when you get to customer experience in a little bit of detail. Um, the biggest thing, in my opinion, is that QA is going to be now transformed using analytics. So, so far, you know, QA does a very good job in general about capturing and reporting metrics, right? And those are what we call descriptive metrics, right? And, and those are all pretty much rear view um, image, right? Because this is stuff that has happened in the past. But where I see a huge transformation that's happening or going to happen is we expect QA to look at past data, be it scheduled data, defect data, or a variety of other data, um, you know, derive models from the data, and then use those models for doing predictive analytics. In other words, not just be reactive, but start to predict how things are going to go from a QA perspective. Where am I going to find the defects? Which teams are, are going to be injecting defects the most, right? Where is the customer experience likely to be impacted? What are the patterns, right, of behaviors or things that are going to impact all these things, right? I see this is the biggest transformation in the QA um, world, right? turning to analytics using big data science technologies to become more and more predictive about how we perform our function. Right? And that's something we call quality intelligence. We're going to spend some time on that as well. Um, we all love test automation. Test automation is our key for agility, right? Uh, who wants to execute tests manually? It takes time, takes effort, is error prone, right? So we do our more and more test automation. But I think that's the thing of the past. The thing of the future is what we call lifecycle automation, right? It's not just about automating the tests, it's about automating the whole process. For example, when developers are finished doing their coding and they check in their code to a source code management system, we need to be able to you know, trigger a build verification test without any human intervention. If the build verification test passes, 
we promote that application to a QA or staging environment and run the tests there. All, of course, using automatic tests, but there is no human intervention, no formal gates, right? Previously, you know, we used to get emails or some other notifications saying, okay, the build is finished, go run QA, or here's what's changed, right? All of the human intervention we're gonna take out, right? We essentially have to be an enabler in the entire DevOps process from requirements to deploy, right? As things get um, built, they need to be QA'd in a form, so it's ready to deploy at any point in time, right? And, there's, and QA has to be a part of the process to enable the agility, right? We're seeing more and more of this concept of robotic process automation. So in other words, the process is automated, but it's intelligent, it learns, uh, it's adaptive based on circumstances, right? So for example, if the system detects, right? Again, this is based on analytics, right? There are certain build patterns, right? Or certain development teams that are causing the builds to fail or QA to fail then you will have gates that automatically adjust themselves saying that I'm not promoting this thing to, to production of the next stage of the life cycle, right? So it's an adaptive thing, which is really all about what robotic process automation is all about. There are other things too, for example, creating test cases dynamically on the fly, right? So we all struggle with this situation around, okay, a build has finished, I need to run a build verification regression test. Well, what suite of, what suite of tests do I need to run? And many times, we're either running too much or too little. And the answer is, well, it's not something that is predetermined. You would you know, generate this set of test cases on the fly, depending on what has changed. Okay? So that's really another example of uh, robotic process automation. Okay. Um, and last but not the least, we're going to have to start becoming an integral part of the whole DevOps journey. Right? Again, a lot of time spent uh, today morning uh, keynote. Um, so today, you know, there is a real flow from dev to test to ops, right? And we're beginning to see more and more uh, of the DevOps shift. But more importantly, this, I'd like you to focus on what I've highlighted there, right? In terms of the skill set, we're beginning to see a transformation from, from quality assurance to quality engineering, which is to say that where QA now plays a bigger role in terms of how quality is assured into the product, built into the product, to a new role that is very, very popular in, in technology companies, like, like you know, Cognizant or, or CA, right? We just call the software engineering test. And this is the whole motion of shift left, right? QA is no longer an independent organization. We're part of the development organization. We're, we're in bed with developers. We're working hand in hand very, very closely with the development team. And we're assuring you know, quality at the code level, which means that, that these guys really, really have to understand the nuances of coding. What constitutes you know, good code quality? What are the good code, you know, coding metrics? How do I refactor? How do I own technical debt, right? That essentially is a shift to the left. But now there's a new pattern that's emerging that's called digital engineering test. And, this, and the reason why we have this thing is because if you think about the digital technologies, you know, big data, analytics, social media, right? You cannot do a good job of quality, doing quality assurance around these things unless you have a good subject matter expertise in these things as well. For example, if you think about big data, right? Most of our customers are ma massively investing in big data. And big data lifecycle is very, very, very different from the traditional software lifecycle, which is the first point I was making, right? In order to be able to do, you know, key aware on big data, you really have to understand big data architecture, you have to understand the big data lifecycle, and so on and so forth, right? So it's almost like a data scientist in test, or a network engineer in test, right? Or, or a social, uh, you know, social scientist in test. So we are beginning to see those kinds of skills transformation. Our customers are demanding those kinds of skills. Um, I also service our, our technology vertical that includes the, the Yahoo's and the Google's and the eBay's of the world, right? And when they come to me as a service provider for testing skills, those are the skills they're looking for. It's no longer about, okay, here's a given set of requirements, right? Write such test cases and automate them, right? They also have to have skills in big data. They also have to have skills in social media, right? All of those additional skills are coming in, which is where we call, you know, data engineer, uh, digital engineering test. Okay. Already. So, so what do we focus on? So now that we have a good understanding of, of the challenges we are trying to solve, and how it is going to be different, I'd like to spend a few minutes on what our solution perspective and POV is. So the order here is not right, but never mind. So first and foremost is assurance of the technology, right? And so this is what we call the digital asset assurance. So this includes you know, doing things like mobile application testing, 
um, social media application testing, uh, testing for social media receptiveness, and so on and so forth. Essentially, the whole SMAC Plus stack. And the Plus includes all of the emerging technologies over and above SMAC, such as IoT, genomics, and who knows what, right? And of course, making sure the entire technology value chain does not disrupt the business, right? That's what we call value chain testing. The second thing is about agility assurance. So this is, in, this is about making sure that Keyway doesn't become an impediment, right? We are here to make the life cycle more agile, right? And, and this is all about DevOps. But notice that I put the T in the middle, right? Because QA is often ignored in the whole DevOps thing, right? They think about you know, Dev and Ops, but where is testing? Well, I mean, it plays a very big role in there, and I'll show you what that role is in the new age of, uh, uh, of DevOps. In, in but the most experience, important thing in my mind is this whole customer experience assurance, and this is all about testing proactively and assuring a certain level of customer experience before the product goes live, and also monitoring and tracking it after production, right? So I'm sure all of you use some form of Google application or the other, right? Google Maps and everything. If you use it, you're, you're being subject to customer experience testing all the time, every day in your life. Every day, you know, Google releases multiple releases to their uh, updates to their application, you know that, right? And they have subtle variations in those applications in terms of, you may, you may be subject to a, a one particular interface and somebody else will be subject to another interface. For example, just a couple of days ago, I realized when I was doing the, um, the driving directions, the traffic icon you know, disappeared from the list of, you know, where, where they show the step-by-step the, the -step direction to somewhere else on the page, right? Whereas my friend, my colleague, he said, no, it hasn't changed for me. So they were ex essentially experimenting, right? To see which one is better, which one is stickier, right? So as an example, uh, that's an example of how they run customer experience testing to see um, you know, what, you know, what's more stickier and what customers would like. And last but not the least, um, it's all about security and, and assuring the information, right? With so much data, in a digital enterprise, security is, is, is important. But other things from a non-functional perspective are also important, such as privacy and security and so on and so forth, right? But I think the most important for, thing for me is this whole notion of quality intelligence. Quality intelligence is about how we do quality smarter, faster, better, by leveraging analytics, okay? So that's, the, that's one, of, one of the key things that I think QA needs to be prepared for. So why don't we look at this as an example, right? So how many of you here are physicians. Thank God, I didn't expect too many physicians to be here um, in the CA world. Even the, one of the, the keynote people today morning was in fact a physician, right? So um, we all as consumers, right, are the receiving end of this whole healthcare industry, right? We don't like the way it is, right? It's very, very physician-centered as opposed to centered around me, right? I'm the patient. Things are wrong with me, right? Why don't they focus on me? It's all about the doctors. The whole system revolves around physicians, right? You go to see them when they are available, right? And they make you wait, right, for half an hour, you know? Um, it's everything, you can't even get a prescription refill, even though they've told you, yes, you've got to take this for one whole year, right? Um, you know, you can't, you can't do that without having the physician's office, you know? Um, personal case, right, I, you know, um, I have sleeping problems, apnea problems, right? And, um, and you know how they do it, right? In order for you to, um, for your doctor to be able to prescribe uh, a treatment from your sleeping problems, they ask you to come and get admitted in a hospital, right? Stay there overnight or a couple of days. They monitor your sleeping patterns, right? And then they, you know, prescribe you whatever medications. But, you know, today you have devices that actually track your sleeping patterns, right? To a great level of detail. So I'm wondering why my physician wouldn't, and, you know, look at the data that I've uploaded to the cloud, right? and then look at that data and do something about it, right? So anyway, so, but things are changing, that's the good news. It will not be physician-centered forever. It is going to be patient-centric, right? The writing is on the wall. So it is going to be more about, it's about me, right? If I have a problem, I want to be able to log on someplace, right? If it's a non-critical, non-emergency you know, non, uh, thing, for example, there are systems like you know, WebMD or, you know, or, or SwiftMD, right, for some of you uh, that have uh, that supported you know, in your healthcare plans, where I can go and, you know, log a note there, within five minutes somebody calls me up and says, you know, what are your symptoms, blah, 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 and I get something and the, the uh, prescription is digitally uh, transmitted to my um, um, you know, pharmacy and, and then who knows, next day the pharma, you know, within a few hours the pharmacy may be actually able to, de able to deliver it to me, right? So anyway, a whole bunch of ways in which the digital, um, the digital is affecting the healthcare industry and, and this is really a changing landscape that we will be seeing very, very soon. Um, so how does it happen then, right? So as I talked about, right, you, you, you figure you've got a problem. Um, you either call or, or you have an app. Matter of fact, you may have an app 
that actually detects that you have a problem, right? With all these embedded devices and sensors and things like that, that might actually be able to you know, tell uh, your health provider or whoever it is, right, that you've got a problem proactively, right? And they do this telemedicine thing, right? And then also you have mechanisms by means of which they can track, right? For, this is, for example, tracking how your blood pressure is doing over time or your heart rate and so on and so forth. And the possibilities are endless. It's no longer uh, would be required for you to actually go to a physician's office and check in and everything. So, and this is what we call, co co call code halos in, in Cognizant. So code halo is what, what we call is a digital sig signature or footprint for everything that you do a, from a physical perspective, right? So the fact that you have a problem or the fact that you know, you're running around or the fact that you're doing something, right? Or you took it a medicine, right? It should all leave a digital footprint, right? because it's enabled through digital technologies, right? And that's what we call code halos. And these code halos are essentially assimilations of data that can collect somewhere, let's say in a cloud system, that can be intelligent, intelligently mined for wonderful things, right? So, so how does it look like then, right? So let's, let's look at it this, uh, this way. Um, so you're a patient, it's patient-centric, right? So the system collects symptoms, right? It could be your, your, your uh, personal device that you wear, um, and it transmits this data to the cloud. Uh, inside the cloud are all these massive analytic systems that identify potential symptoms, causes of symptoms, could, could even you know, prescribe, and then fax the signature or digitally transmit the, the, uh, the, uh, the signature of the disease to your physician or your pharmacy, and, and there you go. So if you look at that whole value chain, we can now start to map the kinds of testing that needs to happen, right? So for example, from a patient perspective, you absolutely have to do uh, testing for the IoT, right? For example, you're wearing a Fitbit device. Right? How many of you wear um, those, those Fitbit devices? Or, or some other device, okay, quite a few. So you, you're, you know what's going on, right? Uh, so you've got to test for that. Um, is the application working? Is the application interfacing with the, with the device correct, in the correct manner? Are the, correct, are the measurements correct, right? Is it able to sync with your mobile phone and so on and so forth, right? Uh, we also have to test for multi-channel because the same information could be collected through multiple different channels, right? Your app, your, your, your device, and so on and so forth. We also have to test for customer experience, right? So there you go. And then on the cloud, where all this data is collecting, right, you've got to do, obviously, the testing for the application on the cloud, right? Which is the resiliency, the failover, the security, and so on and so forth, and, and API testing, right? As, as we discussed in the morning in the keynote, it's all about APIs. So that application on the cloud will be connected to a whole bunch of other services to these APIs, right, that we've got to test for. Of course, we also have to do functionality and performance testing and so on and so forth. And then uh, we also have to do big data testing, right? Because that's where all the analytic systems reside. And big data testing, as I said, is all about testing for, for the capture, cleansing, storage, aggregation, mining, and the, and the generation of the analytics of the intelligence, right? So again, a very different way to test. Um, and last but not the least, um, we have to do the, the omnichannel testing. And, and last but not the least, if you look at the entire value chain, we have to test for agility. In other words, we are doing what we are doing from a QA perspective, not to impede things, but to help it move along, right? So hopefully that gives you an example of how digital assurance fits in a specific uh, industry context, right? And, and the same thing is being played out for every industry that I think about, right? As we, as we talked about in the morning, all the industries are getting disrupted, right? Through one or more of these mechanisms through the use of digital technology, just like healthcare is. I think healthcare is front and center, right? And so this gives you an example, hopefully, of how, for example, quality assurance, the kinds of QA we'll be doing is going to be different in the new world relative to what it is today. Already. So just want to talk a little bit about the value chain assurance. So digital assurance, while it is different than traditional QA, is actually building upon what we've already done, right? We're not going to throw things away. We're going to continue to do core testing, right? Functionality, performance, and security. We're going to add a layer of the additional testing that we do today for social, mobile, analytics, and cloud. But most important for me is the last piece, which is the digital assurance platform, which essentially assures the value chain of information from the point of creation, consumption, aggregation, and then again, recycle, right? So, so for example, the whole life cycle around, let's say, you're subjected to um, a marketing campaign by Google, right? Remember when you do a search for certain things, and then you go to another site, isn't it eerie to see some of those things come up? That's because Google is tracking it. And they're running campaigns based on your past history, right? 
So the whole you know, life cycle is that they're, they're gathering information, they're analyzing it, they're creating a campaign, they're sending it to you, they're testing for the effectiveness, et cetera, et cetera. That whole life cycle is really what, what the value chain is all about. And assuring the quality of the entire life cycle requires something special. And that's a digital assurance platform. So digital assurance platform is all about an analytics-driven quality assurance platform. So, so if you look at the whole process, plan through operate, right? Customers are now investing seriously in all kinds of different analytics platforms. Here are some examples, right? For example, you've got business analytics platforms. Um, essentially, your source code management system is actually your, your dev analytics platform. There's a the treasure trove of data in there, right? All customers have test management systems, right? It's where they keep their test cases and the defects and everything. That's your test analytics platform, even if you don't realize it is, right? Um, customers have ops analytics platforms where they're tracking you know, all the, the logs, production logs, and so on and so forth. And last but not the least, the, the new kinds of uh, data that's being populated about customer behavior. We call this customer analytics. So if you look at all of that stuff, that's really a treasure trove of data for QA to mine to do smarter QA. And here's some examples, right? How do we do requirements validation today? For those of you who are in the QA, um, in the QA profession, right? We typically uh, will sit down with a business analyst, right? And they will tell us, yeah, we think these are the you know, top priority requirements, right? Um, you know, these are the things that we need first, and this is how we verify the requirements and put in requirements management system, right? In the new world of digital, you can get that information directly from your end customers. And you know where to look for? The social media, right? So I'll give you an example of, um, of a big, uh, you know, let me, let me call them out by name, Nike, for example, right? So when Nike launched their Fitbit device several generations ago, they wanted to see, okay, well, how is the product being received in the market? What features do my customers like and what they're not like, right? Uh, so it was all out there in the social media, right? So what we did was, you know, we mined all the data from the social channels, right? Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and we were able to unearth an amazing amount of information in terms of what, did the, what features would the customer not like? What features would the customer like? What would they like in the next version, right? What are the defects and bugs that need to be prioritized in the next iteration or the next print, right? So it's amazing um, how much it is out there. So again, this is digital business assurance, right? Uh, dev analytics, um, we already talked about this a little bit, right? If you look at the amount of data that resides in the source code management systems, in the, in, in the code itself, it's amazing. Uh, in general, in the old world, QA does not have too much access to the source code, right? How many of you in the QA profession actually get to look at the source code? One or two, okay. So that's going to be changing big time because as customers build you know, bespoke systems, right? Customer systems of engagement, you're going to be working much more closely with the development team, right? We, we talked about the software engineering test. And if you mine the data, right, in terms of, okay, what's the build frequency, uh, what's the release frequency, or what's the commit frequency, and what are the types of defects that are coming uh, from different kinds of developers, right? How many builds have failed, right? If you start to analyze all the data, you get to, you know, amazing amount of intelligence that existed there. For example, a very specific thing that I like to talk about as I mentioned, is how much do I need to test when things change, right? So if you look at the old traditional way, we look at, okay, well, this requirement has changed. So I do an impact analysis based on this requirement change, right? What I don't do, what, or Kiwi doesn't do is look at the code level to see, okay, if this code has changed, what are the test cases that are impacted, right? That's a much, much finer level granularity of impact, change impact-based testing, which we call code change impact-based testing, right? Now, if you have access to the source code, if you have access to the source code management systems, you can now start to write all these intelligent queries, mine the data, and, and begin to figure out, here's a list of test cases that have actually been impacted by even one line of change, or 100 lines of change, or whatever. So you can now start to do this at the commit level, at the build level, release level, at multiple different levels, right? It's amazing. We've actually built some very good uh, um, you know, technologies here, and, and my partner in crime, you know, Vikul, uh, Gupta out there, and both of us will be available um, after the session. So we built some, some very cool technologies that enable this to happen, where we've actually worked with customers, we've reduced the regression cycle, you know, testing cycles by more than 80%. Because now it's based on specifically what has changed, right? Even though the requirement has not changed, code has changed, right? So don't run the entire regression test, okay? Uh, test analytics is all about mining your test information, right? Again, you have a lot of data in there. You've got all your past test, you know, test cases and defects and test run logs, right? 
and, and we've got fantastic metrics, right? Keyword generates a lot of metrics around defect efficiency and, and testing efficiency and all that kind of stuff. But if you take a more of an analytics-oriented approach, right, in terms of what are the patterns that led to those defects, right, and start to do correlations, right? For example, these defects were correlated to these factors, right? Or this kind of scheduled delay, you know, were correlated to these factors, right? Now you can start to make some predictive behaviors, right? For example, you can say, you know what? After two or three you know, sprints, you can actually tell your you know, product owner or the, or the scrum master, look, I'm beginning to see patterns right, from my past behavior that's going to impact the release date of this product. You better do some adjustments to your velocity or team size or whatever. Right? And we have customers, right? I'll name another one customer. Um, Hartford Insurance is, is an example of a customer where we've, where we've implemented the system. Right? They're looking at the data from the test management systems, importing into our tool, and they've generated some very good models that, that are helping them understand um, you know, what kinds of delays they can, you know, they can ex experience in the schedule, or where could defects be found that they're not anticipating. Um, and last but not the least, the ops analytics is about mining the ops data. For example, you know, how are you, your users using your system, right? What kinds of transactions are they executing? Where are they stuck, right? And this is an example of the test that I mentioned that Google is running on you, right? It's called A-B testing, right? Uh, they release multiple, you know, versions of the product for different people, they're trying to see which one sticks based on different kind of user behavior before they finalize on the, on the final version that gets released to the whole population, right? So that's, that's what we call multivariate testing, right? Similar kind of techniques can be used, for example, for failure prediction. There are a certain set of correlations that happen early in the life cycle that helps us to predict behavior in production as well, okay? So those are all examples. Alrighty. I want to talk a little bit about DevOps because you know, DevOps is such a big uh, part of everything that, that we do now, right? And how is QA's role um, changing in, a, in, in the world of DevOps? And this is a cost question that many of my customers ask, ask me because what's really happening, if you think about it, developers are shifting right, and the ops guys are shifting left. Have you guys noticed that? Developers, you know, are, are oops, sorry. Developers are doing more and more what QA used to do, right? Because they're now saying, okay, you know what? I can do code, code level quality, I can do, you know, so the software engineering test role, right? I can do, you know, the, the user behavior testing and so on and so forth. Uh, particularly, for example, if you look at customers like Google, right? They don't have an ops team at all. The team that actually builds the software maintains the software. So, and so similarly, we, see find, we find the operations guys are shifting left because they need to be involved more and more early in the life cycle. So QA is getting squeezed, right? And my customers, QA directors, VP of QA often ask me, well, how do I survive in this, survive in this new world, right? So let's talk about some of the dimensions. So the um, so first thing is yeah, QA has to shift right. And what do we mean by that? And, and this is all about taking advantage of the operation side analytics to do smarter QA as an example taking advantage of the production logs to learn about you know, what kinds of transactions are my, are my customers executing that I can use, for example, to do better behavioral modeling, right? Or, for example, better performance testing, right? Uh, another example is a lot of you might have experienced that a lot of defects come from the fact that, that there's an environment mismatch between the development environment, the test environment, the staging environment, the production environment, right? Very, very frequently, Many, many uh, you know, problems happen because of the subtle differences in, in environment, right? For example, um, the developer who builds the code uses the latest and greatest version of some shared library or, or some library that he or she has downloaded from the internet, right? And it works great for them, right? He or she might have told QA, and QA also updates that environment accordingly, right? But the staging and production environments haven't, haven't changed, and nobody actually bothered to tell them, or it's probably somewhere in the queue, right? The application goes to staging and production and fails, and a whole bunch of time is spent in triaging and fixing and things like that, right? So QA can now play a bigger role in making sure that environments are consistent, right? And so there are a whole bunch of techniques that are now available um, to do what we call static validation of environments, right? Before any environment is actually provisioned. And this is accomplished using technologies like Chef and Puppet, where you can actually do modeling of environments. And once you have a model, then it's called, you know, you can actually codify it, right? which is called infrastructure as code, and once you have code, you can QA it, right? That's, that's a big shift uh, for QA in, in, a, in, in a DevOps world, right? We already talked about shift left. So shift left is working more closely with the developers, right? Getting, picking up the software engineering and test skills, making sure that we build it right, as opposed to test it right. So build to run, opposed to test to run, okay? Um, shift up is the concept of doing business validation based on real user behavior. So we already talked about that, how customers like Nike and Google 
are doing requirements validation based on user analytics, right? So you're helping the business figure out, what do I need to do next? What are my real users telling me, right? Et cetera. And shift deep is QA looking in, into itself, which is mining all the data that we have from a QA perspective and somewhere else in the life cycle to do smarter QA, getting out of the way, right? This is in more introspective. Uh, so these are the four dimensions. So the key thing here is, Number one is that the quality needs to be continuous. It's not a stage in the life cycle anymore, right? You build things for quality, right? You test it and you release and deploy it, right? Quality needs to be frictionless. In other words, we are not getting in the way. Everything is automated. And we've automated also the life cycle process. In other words, the build happens. Immediately following the build, a new set of test cases get defined on the fly. The test happens. They get promoted to the next stage of the life cycle. Test happens and so on and so forth, right? So it's frictionless. There is no longer the handoff, the formal handoff and email exchanges or even um, you know, tool exchanges, right? Because you've got an integrated tool chain that moves data along, right? And the focus again now shifts to you know, build, to build to run as opposed to test to run, right? In other words, when I'm building something, I got quality built in for the first time, right? As opposed to, okay, the developer does uh, development and then we test it out. Okay, so what are the develop DevOps implications for QA? We got to you know, sustain velocity, but also maintain, cannot sacrifice quality, right? So I'll, I'll point out a couple of things only over here because we've talked about this thing all, you know, mostly. Uh, so number one is make sure that we're aware of what it takes to assure a high level of code quality. Because if the code is broken, if you don't have good quality in the code, then you can't really scale quality anymore, right? You're going to be testing it, you're going to be spending more time finding defects, it's going to be a round trip between dev and test all the time. So the focus is really going to be shift left and assure a high level of quality in the code of the system that's being built first time, okay? Um, number two is, you know, uh, test what matters, right? And in the, in the world of digital, what really, really matters is the customer experience. So I'll have a slide that talks about how do we assure customer experience early on in the life cycle and not late, right? Number three is automate aggressively. And this is not just about test automation. Automate the life cycle. Automate things like the environment, right? We talked about how, for example, you can automate the provisioning of your test environment, provisioning of the test data, right? You, you know, provisioning of virtual services and so on and so forth. Whole bunch of technologies that the CA has available. All of those things now become part of the automation of the environment. So that, you know, QA is not being held up because of the lack of environment, nor is you know, QA, you know, uh, holding up the rest of the life cycle saying, oh, you know what, the operations guys are not giving me environment, right? It's all about modeling those environments up front and then provisioning them on demand. And last but not the least, virtualize, virtualize, virtualize. And again, multiple dimensions of virtualization. You know, it's not just about application virtualization or hardware virtualization. It's about network virtualization. It's about data virtualization. How many times do we hear about, okay, QA is held up because, you know, the test data is not available or the test data is available, but so huge that they can't do anything about it, right? Just yesterday, um, a customer came up to me and, and, had, and told me they have a million XML files that generate you know, a zillion you know, test data elements, right? And it's becoming an unscalable problem. So, so again, the solutions like data virtualizations may be able to help. Again, these are technologies that, that uh, the CA is investing in heavily. Highly recommend that you look at all of these dimensions of virtualization, not just uh, you know, uh, hardware virtualization. And last but not the least, focus on the skills. We already talked about this whole transformation that's happening, particularly in the tech industry, around the shift from QE to SCT to DET. Already. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how we test for a complicated situation that, that includes IoT, right? So if you think about uh, what IoT means, it could be the Fitbit devices, or in the case of Google, it could be the car that will be driving you around someday in the future, right? These are things which have hundreds of sensors in them that talk to each other, Talk back to the to the home network, right? And then talk to talk to your mobile device and so on and so forth, right? How do you test for something like that? So you get, essentially there are three layers of these things, right? You've got the, the devices, the things, the smart things, your your, for example, your your nest device at home, right? And you've got people, right? Obviously, customers, us at the front and center of everything. Then you've got the network piece, and then you've got the back, you know, back end, right? So we have to do the testing in a very different manner. The test environment challenges for, for a situation like this are enormous. For example, one of my customers is, is an energy company that is now moving from smart, you know, batch-oriented smart grids to real-time grids based on the data coming from the home devices, right? Through, through the home network, which is hosted in Nest, right? Google Nest. So they want to be able to, be able to control the flow of information based on exactly how, you, when and when you turn on your refrigerator or, or your washing device or whatever, right? So what we have to do for that, right? We're not going to build a million homes, 
You don't want to put a thousand cars in the street to test that, right? We might have to do that, but I think we're going to do, be, we can be smarter about that. Right? So what we can do is create emulators and simulators that emulate all those things, right? For example, a baby walking out of a crib, right? That's, that's an example of a trigger, motion sensor, right? At the same time, you also need non-conventional types of automation, right? As an example, um, Bobby walk, you know, baby walking out of a crib, or for example, the fact that you're, you're, you are wearing a device, right? And you move your hands up and down, you walk, right? So that requires robotics testing. So we have smart robots that simulate all those motions and other things that can now be used as trigger for providing data for tests, right? So that's the big piece of this thing. And within that piece, we've created some um, technology within CTS, uh, Cognizant, that we call RoboWare and Blowlink that simulate, for example, all of these uh, devices and sensors and the motions. The middle piece is where you uh, virtualize the network, right? So this is very interesting, again, uh, where you can simulate different kinds of traffic conditions and network conditions because that impact your end user experience as well as your backend server performance, right? And last but not the least is the, the backend, which we understand very well. And this is where technologies can be used, include service virtualization and analytics testing, okay? So here's an example of social driven QA. Um, and this is something we've done for um, customer like Nike. Um, so again, we talked about this example. The way this worked is, we collected all this data from social media network, and then we put them into a big, da you know, big data uh, system based on Hadoop. We mined and analyzed the data, and then we looked for patterns, right? And a very interesting example is we were getting a lot of uh, feedback from tropical countries around inaccuracy of the measurements and vitals, right? And it turns out that humidity actually impacts the accuracy of those measurements, right? And the Nike product team had forgotten to take into consideration the impact of humidity. And unfortunately, the test team, Cognizant test team, also failed into account to test for that, right? So there's an example of a test case that we, in, that we came across that we should have had, and we added it to our test. Uh, but also, more importantly, it helped Nike prioritize new features in the next iteration of the firmware, right? So, you know, as they went through iterations. So that's a great example um, that I cite for how we use social data for better quality assurance. So customer experience testing, this is the last subject. Um, again, it's very different, why? Because it's people-centric, it's very emotion-driven, right? This isn't just about yes, no answer. In QA, we all like, did it pass or did it fail, right? In customer experience testing, there is no black and white, it's gray, right? They roll out features, some people like it, some people don't, some people violently object, some people say, oh yeah, I don't care, right? So it's all kinds of gray sh shades of gray in there, right? So it's a very different way to test, and, and the answer to this thing lies in analytics. There's no one, one right answer, unlike traditional key where we pass or fail, right? The whole idea is to run these uh, tests in a variety of forms and look for patterns that, that are statistically significant, right? So how do we do this across the life cycle? So number one is, when we are strategizing and planning, we have to first make strategies based on what customers really, really want, right? Just as we talked about in the morning, right? Um, designing products for customer experience first. It's not just about functionality, performance, and security, right? Number one. Number two is, with the designing of the application is happening, use RWD, right? Responsive web design principles to make sure that, that whatever you're building will be delivered across multiple channels, right? It's not just about the mobile app or the portal. It can be on a, on a, on a device that you're wearing, and in the future, who knows, other devices where you download things into, you know, into your body functions, right? You know, genomics, whatever it is, right? But it has to be delivered across multiple channels and has to give a consistent experience across all of those channels, right? Of course, when we do uh, release and deployment, we talked about A-B testing, right? You release multiple versions of the product because you don't know exactly what's going to stick, right? And then you do um, you know, uh, multivariate analysis to see which, which one is best. But you also do RWD testing. There are lots of techniques now available that allow you to do automated testing across multiple form factors and devices, cross-browser, cross-platform, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, once you go post-production, you look at all of the analytics that are coming from, um, you know, from real users, but also you can do in the wild testing, something we call customer experience testing, right? So it's a very new form of testing where instead of using standard tester to do the testing, you let it lose on generic users, right? And there are companies like Applause that provide this kind of service, um, and then you can collect feedback from that again. Most of the feedback will be very unstructured. It will not be yes, no, right, right, wrong answers, right? I sort of like it, I don't like it, maybe, right? I don't care. Again, it's all about analyzing that information to come up with uh, good, uh, good data. So I'll summarize here with some of the key takeaways uh, that we had, right? Number one is we've got to look beyond app software applications, right? We look at the experience 
we got to look very, very strongly at intelligence. Um, how, do, how can you do better co intelligent quality based on analytics? Look at life cycle automation and, and, and upskill ourselves to learn digital technologies. All right, so with that, I'm going to bring that to a close and see if there's any questions. No? Yes, please use the mic, yeah. Hey, you mentioned at one point reducing uh, regression testing by 80% yes. by only running the tests. Yes. When the code under test changed, can yes. you talk a little bit more about how you accomplished that? Yes, absolutely. So, very good question. Um, so, the question is, how did we reduce the, the size of the regression tests by 80% by looking at code-based changes as opposed to what we were doing before, right? The whole idea is to create a system where you can map your code to tests, okay? And the way you do that is by using technologies that instrument the code, either at the source level or at the object level, right? For example, if you've got a C++ binary or you've got Java code, right? You instrument that first. Then you run your tests. So as the test executes, right, your binaries are, because you've instrumented them, you know exactly which parts of the code are getting touched, right? So if you've got an automated test suite, it's very easy now, right? You run the whole suite, and then you get the mapping. So what it does, it establishes the mapping between the code and the test. The so next time the code changes, for example, a developer checks in code, you emit, because of the mapping you've established, you can now immediately start to identify the impact zone, right? And of course, there's various ways of doing that, but the mapping is the key. The code is to test mapping is a key thing, right? That's one. The other thing is looking at analytics of past, of past defects, right? So for example, you know, these, these kinds of changes triggered these kinds of defects that related to these kinds of tests, right? Use that level of energy. But, for, but the most important thing, is establishing and exploiting the code to test map, okay? So we have some technology if you want, I can, I can, we can do the demos and all that kind of stuff. I mean, huge, right? Because now the testers have an ability in a non-disruptive manner. Sorry, I'm, I'm being asked to uh, shut down here. Non-disruptive manner as in, you don't have to b bug your developers, right? All that information that you need is in your source code management system or on your object system where the codes have been compiled and things like that. Hopefully that gives you an answer. I know it's a short answer, but you know, we can talk more about this. Okay, so uh, I think I'm done. Thank you very much, guys, for attending. Hopefully this was informative. Um, come see, see me if you need more information about anything. Thank you, bye-bye.